Welcome to the Terrible Podcast with your host from SteelersDepot.com, where you can find all your latest and greatest Steelers news. It's Dave Bryan and Alex Kazora, always lit, talking Steelers. And now, here's Dave and Alex. Welcome to the Terrible Podcast, Season 13, Episode 72. He's Stay Brian. I'm Alex Kazora, SteelersDepot.com. Thank you so much for being back with us here this Monday, Dave. Officially the first day of the Pittsburgh Steelers offseason. They took care of business beating the Cleveland Browns 28-14 to on Sunday, but they just missed out on getting all the help they needed. Buffalo did beat the Patriots, but Miami Dolphins get the 7 seed beating the New York Jets 11 to six. And so the Steelers season officially comes to an end and we are quickly transitioning into off season mode. One reason why this podcast released a bit later on Monday, Dave and I waiting until Mike Tomlin spoke with the media for his year end wrap up. That was at noon. And so we wanted to wait until after that to record and talk about what Tomlin said. So, so many mixes of emotions and waves and feelings. It's um, it's a lot to process, Dave. <laughs> was it at least a score gummy with that 11 to six score? I don't think it was. Uh, OK, uh, I don't know. You know, you kind of watching you kind of uh, uh, have uh, you know, uh, all three of your eyes going different, <laughs> uh, different directions, if you will, trying to watch the scoreboard and keep up what's going around around the league. And at one point, I think all three games were tied, uh, 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 you know, uh, in the, in the second half or, or, or close to it there. And you're thinking, all right, I, you know, maybe this thing's going to wor- end up working out for them. And the Steelers, you know, obviously started to pull away a little bit and, you know, the, uh, it looked like the bills were going to take care of the uh, 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 of the Patriots there, and then you're looking at you know what's going to happen there with that Jets game, uh, and I think for a long time it was six uh, six there, and ah uh, you know the, the, I think the Jets had the ball I don't know five minutes four minutes left and all, and they couldn't do anything had to punt it away, and that's when you started having that sink, sinking feeling in your stomach, you know at that point, and I think there was a horse collared. Uh, penalty by the Jets or whatnot and moved the ball down. Long story short, uh, it didn't work out for the Steelers. And, uh, you know, you've gone all these, you know, uh, several weeks now with it seeming that a lot of things had gone the Steelers' way on the scoreboard, right? You know, a lot of games, you know, obviously the Chargers uh, uh, locking it up, you know, a couple of weeks ago obviously didn't stay in the Steelers' favor. But the path that you thought that that was most likely for them to get in, was still very much alive and very much alive, you know, in, I think into the second half of, well, obviously well into the second half of those games yesterday, but uh, there's a, there's a quick solution to all this, Alex. And that's mm-hmm. uh, not being in this situation where you have to depend on help uh, mo- moving forward. And I think that's one thing kind of Mike Tomlin, you know, uh, in so many words kind of stated during his wrap up press conference on, on, on Monday, there is uh you know, what, what can this team do to not have the, the two and six start that they had? And, uh, more specifically, I'd look back at that, uh, at, at that game against the jets there, because that's the one I think, uh, uh, was one that you really have to circle and say, man, uh, if they grab that one, or that's one that they probably should have had that, that, that would have kept them out of the situation that they were in. Exactly. I did just check. No score gami in that game. 11 to six happened one time before. So the second time a game is ended 11 to six. And as you just said, uh, ironically enough, after losing to the Jets, you needed the Jets to win to beat the Dolphins and the fight in Joe Flacco's could not make it happen. So that's where Pittsburgh's at. Of course, they do finish the season nine and eight. And so they do have a winning record and Mike Tomlin's uh, now <laughs> non-losing streak continues, which as much as we joke about it and don't love this stat and Tomlin doesn't seem to either, the players certainly use that as one motivating factor. Of course, getting in the postseason, trying to compete is the main, you know, the carrot to, to chase after these last couple of weeks, but the players talked about it openly. Najee Harris, Robert Spillane, and others saying is that they do not want to be the team that was responsible for the first losing season. And so, you know, it is a seven and two back half of the year. There is a lot of reason for optimism in 2023, but there is no playoffs in 2022. Yeah, so by not wanting it to become a story, it became sort of a story, you know, and something that I guess the uh, 
uh, you know, several, several, several guys or most of the team uh, uh, took, took a hold of, you know, not, not wanting, uh, I, you know, in so many words, I, I guess all the bumper stickers stay on the cars right now. Right. Uh, <laughs> I uh, guess. It, 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 you know, it's not much of a look it, it, and I, you know, my terrible take that I had a couple of days ahead of this, uh, I, I, I think Mike Tomlin did a hell of a job to get this team to, to nine and eight, but within all that, you know, it, it's a nine and eight team and they did not make the playoffs. So this was kind of the, you know, the question I asked the other day, where, where is the, where is the fine line, happy medium? Well, I mean, basically it is a happy medium, you know, and you know, that that's just not good enough. I mean, in, in one instance, I think, yeah, it was a hell of a job to get this team to nine and eight. Cause look, as I stated, and as you stated, I, I think both of us predicted this team to go eight and nine, uh, a couple of games about, you know, halfway through this, 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 this season, I started thinking, man, I, I might've overshot this thing, uh, by a little bit, but we did know that if the team was going to win some games, it'd probably be in the second half of this half, half of the season that that's obviously the way it turned out there, but yeah, should, should, should he be applauded for getting this team one game over where the quote unquote experts, you and I thought this team would be? Well, I think really all that matters is not just where this team is at right now, but where their head is. And it's the only thing to talk about now is the future, the off season and the 2023 version of this team. There, there are two parts. It can be both in. I don't think it has to be either or where you can sit there and say that you're optimistic about the growth of this offense and the improvement of the offensive line. Najee Harris, Kenny Pickett, of course, the conversation starts there and the growth that he showed uh, the second half of the season, taking care of the football, making plays, winning games late being the unquestioned starter in 2023, that's a, a good box to check. Uh, the defense, of course, improving, T.J. Watt getting healthier. There's going to be more changes defensively than offensively, but generally speaking, the core guys, the main names, should be back next season. So, you know, I don't try to do a have the parade for 9-8 and eight and keeping the Tomlin streak alive, but you can also recognize this team went 7-2 and two the last nine games. They played a lot better football, and that should be a you know good springboard into next season. All right, but but once again, why why were we? What was the main? You know, why were we thinking this team would be uh, uh, sub five hundred for the first time in forever uh, ahead of the season? Where, where does that blame go? Uh, at no point, Alex, from the time this team, you know, really ahead of them going to training camp, at no point did I ever think, man, this team might be a playoff team, or or e even if they make the playoffs. Uh, uh, this team has a shot at the Super Bowl. Who, where did, where is that just part of the, you know, the cycle of well, teams can't be in the playoffs all the time, or or mm -hmm. or yeah, you, know, you see what I'm getting at there. Where, sure. where, you know, you got to be able to place blame somewhere here, and and really, I think if we we hit on this, it's been a long time since we talked about this. This team not didn't has not drafted extremely well over the last couple of years. And for a team that builds to the draft more so than they do free agency, I think that's where it starts. So as good of a uh, general manager as, as Kevin Colbert was for, for, for a long time, I think the blame, a good part of blame on for, for this 2022 season going really sort of the way we thought it might go. Uh, lays at the feet of Kevin Colbert. Well, you've always known I've had a, a different take. I think they've drafted better in my view than what you think, but you could argue they're not prioritizing the right positions in terms of not investing enough in the O-line, the D-line, and you felt the growing pains and consequences of that early in the season. And, and I think that's an overall takeaway. I think just the, the transitional year of it all, the first year without Ben, you know, you're going with a veteran quarterback in Trubisky, new to you, a first round pick in Kenny Pickett a young offense in general, incredibly young offense. It didn't have leadership and guidance and a lot of experience overall, new faces, moving pieces. There are those growing pains. And certainly you would say the offense was an issue throughout this year, finishing 26 in points per game and just not finishing drives enough. And all the things we talked about over the course of the season, not closing out games enough. They didn't do that well the first half of the year. So if you want to talk about blame, it is the transitional period of it all. It is the TJ Watt injury. It, of course, is the offense just not simply scoring enough. Um, but again, it does it all, does that all lie on Kevin Colbert? 
if you're going to criticize to me, it's more about not prioritizing the right positions as it is him just simply not drafting good players at the positions they took. Okay. I mean, could, could Mike Tomlin coached any better to get this team into, uh, to, uh, to make a run at Super Bowl? For, I mean, I'm, for, forget I'm making sure the playoffs because they, they, you know, they're, 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 uh, a fourth quarter from the Jets game away from making the Super Bowl. I mean, uh, playoffs. playoffs. Yeah. I mean, I, this was not going to be a Super Bowl team, my estimation. I think, again, some of the other reasons why we thought this team was going to struggle, you're now in a very tough AFC North, a tough AFC overall with great quarterback play. And Pittsburgh's going to have to eventually get to a point where Kenny Pickett can compete with all the young, rising, or already established names in the AFC North and AFC at large to, for, for this team to really consistently compete and win and, and, and be a Super Bowl type of team. We knew that schedule is going to be tougher this year. So you combine all those factors. That's kind of why I thought they would be an 8-9 team. All right. But the people want some blood today, Alex. You know, So we got to give them some blood. Where does the blame lie for this team not being a Super Bowl contending team? Well, like I said, I think it was back even, to, even though to, we we knew that this was not going to be a Super Bowl contending sure. team. Well, it goes back to the offense when you're 26 in points per game, when you scored more than 25 points in two games all year, you're not going to win in the climate that is 2022. Now, granted, scoring was down a bit this year, but still it's, you know, you got to be able to score points to to win games in that transitional period of a young offense that had to figure out an identity. This offense lacked an identity until after the bye week. And when you wait that long to figure out who you are, much less how do you win, there's going to be struggles and growing pains. So it's a young offense that really had to find itself. And that's a, a central reason for their early season struggles. They're two and six and three and seven start. I do think the uh, the defense came around nicely, especially in the same. I mean, you get you don't have TJ Watt. <laughs> here, here, here's the fix to that: put TJ Watt back in the mix. Mm-hmm. Uh, and look, they also got you know Casey back, and I think uh, as he got back and more comfortable uh, in there, things started uh, 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 you know to 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 be better there. Uh, but I mean, I think just overall, and look, I mean, let, let's face it: the, the 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 level of competition that this team faced in the second half of the season helped, I think helped your sure. cause uh, because just one, uh, I think only one time in the, uh, you know, past the bye week, this team gave up more than 17 points on the scoreboard. And that was to a good team in, 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 in the Bengals, obviously everything else was 17 or fewer points. Uh, uh, yeah, but, but within that, I, I think, I mean, there were some key moments in some games here uh, that, that I thought the defense really would really, really did a good job of rising up and also I think you know the defense in the second half of the season specifically because they did give up some explosive plays and 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 and, and you know weren't great against the run early on but I, I think the defense came around I think the offense even though there was you know some progress on the offensive side of football at least they sort of forged a, you know like like we said right they uh they mastered being a below, below average offense kudos on that but uh it still wasn't anywhere close enough to because they needed to win at least one or two more of those games uh one of them was against the ravens and one of them you know both of them were afc north ball uh that uh, that they lost during the second half of the season there so uh is that where you know does it does it lay on uh, Matt Canada the most in in all of this? Well, you know me, I don't like trying to assign blame to to just one person, and there's blame to go around for everybody, whether your offense, defense, special teams, coaching, bad luck, schedule. I mean, there's a million different ways you could slice and dice this this thing up. So, if anyone's looking for a singular answer as to why this team struggled the way that it struggled, I think you're you're looking way too too narrowly at the season at large. All right. Well, we got plenty of time to reverse engineer this and 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 talk about you know the season more. I guess in in depth, uh, you know the finality of it and all like that. We'll we'll stay with three podcasts a week here for 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 the next couple of weeks, I'm sure. But uh, all right. Uh, uh, how about the game in general yesterday? Is that where you want to go next? Sure. We won't spend as much time as typical because the game feels so insignificant knowing what we know now. But again, Pittsburgh beating the Browns 28 to 14 to go to nine and eight on the air. It's kind of hard for me to describe this game. It wasn't a very clean game by anybody, by the Steelers, by the Browns, certainly not by the officials in this one. I would just (laughs) say Pittsburgh finding their footing with the run game in the second half. Again, the offense, generally speaking, we'll talk about Najee Harris fumble here in a second, taking care of the football, winning the turnover battle at least. 
uh, converting on third down, and then the splash plays by the defense, by Levi Wallace, by DeMonte Casey, and the pressure Pittsburgh got late in the game, probably some of the bigger reasons why this team won. Just a really sloppy game with all parties involved uh, uh, for, for the most part. And that, as you as you said, uh, the officials included their uh, quick takeaways, I, I, I think, was this team ran the ball early, uh, ran it well, too. Uh, and then, you know, couldn't seem like it couldn't or, or didn't try to run the football for a little bit. Kenny Pickett, I thought, uh, out of structure was, was, was making some plays and, 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 and kind of a continuation of, 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 you know, kind of where he left off the, uh, the other night against the, uh, against, uh, you know, against the Ravens there, uh, in structure, I not not so great. I I don't think overall. Now I've I've watched like six plays of the all twenty two before we got on here, but uh, uh, definitely want to see some more. You know he did. You know obviously later in the game, I think he played a little bit better in structure. Uh, they uh, you set up that uh, that that score to uh, or or on the on the actual score to George Pickens. Yeah, I think it was a busted coverage, but you know to hear him talk, that was something that. Uh, uh, that they saw on tape along those lines there. He also had, you know, another back, you know, good back shoulder throw over uh, to Pickens. I guess basically, you know, the theme of the second half was Pickens comes alive. Uh, if, if you will, mm-hmm. sort of like uh, probably way before your time, Frampton comes alive. Uh, yeah, Pickens no idea come, what that okay, is. Okay. Peter Frampton, you know, uh, 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 quintessential live album in the seventies. Frampton, Peter Frampton come, it's called Frampton comes alive. Kind of started off. Uh, kind of a, a trend of, of live rock albums, if you will. But uh, anyway, uh, where was I? Okay. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> look, Pickens, I, yeah, yeah. Pick, Pickens in the second half, I thought was good. I thought, you know, they, they, they started to get their, uh, you know, a little bit more of the running game back, back again. But, you know, the, I think the story overall was, man, the defense really clamped it down, mm-hmm. uh, really was able to, uh, to, 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 to get, uh, the Browns, I think, you know, in, in some, uh, bad situations there. And even though Watson, I thought did a good job, uh, extending some plays with his legs, uh, when they really needed to get after him, they were able to get after him and put him on the ground and the amount of sacks that they had. Look, I, I think overall on the offensive side of football, you kind of, you look back and I think what six explosive plays, five or six explosive plays, uh, in this game. And you know, that, uh, uh, that was nice to see, at least to close the season down with, you know, have, have those many explosive plays there, but, uh, uh, they just did the things necessary, necessary to win on the defensive side of football, got some short fields, got some uh, points off of turnovers and, you know, cashed in, you know, uh, when, when they needed to. Yeah, that sums it up. Played a uh, good enough ball in the second half of this one is my overall feeling here. Uh, making some plays on on weighty down situations. Um, you know, the, the strike from Pickett to Connor Hayward. Um, again, the, the pressure this team got in the second half. Certainly containing Deshaun Watson, an issue throughout, as expected. You know, him breaking tackles, extending the play. Tough to consistently win as a defense that way. But as you said, they kind of clamped things down late and the two picks were... We're obviously significant by Levi Wallace and a great read and jump by DeMonte mm-hmm. Casey on his interception. And so yeah, Pittsburgh, 9 of 15 on third down, win the turnover battle, plus one there, uh, run the ball better in the second half, finish drives off in the second half, uh, make your field goals, no back-breaking plays. That's enough to get the win. Mm-hmm. Yeah, especially, I mean, let the, it kind of seemed, and, and, and the Browns got more beat up as the game went along. Yeah, I think right. even uh, Reggie Ragland got beat up. I don't think uh, 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 Ward played a whole heck of a lot, if any, in that game. And they were already without uh, one of their edge rushers. Uh, Green Hunt went down in this yeah, game. Yeah, Hunt right? went yeah. down, didn't want one of their tackles get banged up or something. Yeah, uh, Wills at the end of the game. Yeah, you know, just uh, they were just re- ready to get get to the golf course. I think. <laughs> yeah, they were clowny, of course, not playing the injuries they carried into this game with uh, the right tackle Jack Conklin not being available. Um, speaking of injuries, really should note that because there was a scary one. Uh, we have some some much better news on. Thankfully, Pat Frymuth injured his knee in that game. Um, was quickly ruled out. It did not look good. Had to be really uh, heavily assisted to come off the field. Of course, fearing thing, things like torn ACL, you posted the clip of the injury. It did not look good. But news today from Jerry Dulac, and then confirmed by Mike Tomlin on Monday, is it's just a sprain, no full tear, no surgery needed. And so a worst-case scenario, thank, thankfully avoided 
um, for Pat Frymuth. with Gunnar Olszewski also with a leg injury in this game. No update on him. He doesn't seem maybe quite as serious, but uh, of course the focus here on Frymuth in avoiding a worst case scenario. Boy, it didn't look good last night when I went back to the TV tape to mm-hmm. look at that, man. It, 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 it really didn't. And, uh, uh, I started to think, I uh, started to do the math in my head, even thinking, oh man, how many, you know, uh, is this some gonna... Miller vibes happen to him? Yeah, uh, back I did. Right yeah, I yeah. did. Uh, uh, because I think that happened in either the last game or the next, uh, next yeah. to last game, uh, way back many moons ago. And then, you know, went through the whole, uh, training camp process and, you know, th- having to wait for him to get on the field. What was it? Third or fourth game, uh, that, uh, that season that he finally did get on the field and, and, you know, the old Kevin Colbert uh, remarks about, you know, players never the same until after a full one year, full year uh, uh, removed from that, blah, blah, blah. So uh, uh, I, I must admit that a lot, a lot, there were a lot of articles starting to form in my head of which way to kind of, kind of go with that. Uh, Cause I was kind of really expecting the worst when it came to him. So uh, good news, uh, good Definitely good news, uh, and and you know uh, supposedly going to avoid surgery. Mike Tomlin said, and you know if there's if there's a, you know one certain positive that you can hang coming out of that game and them not making the playoffs, it's the fact that uh, you know Pat Fryman should be good to go later on in the off season. Right by training camp at the uh, latest, he should be a hundred percent and and out there practicing. So. Again, from this game, I know we're kind of a little more all over the place in terms of talking about offense, defense, the offense in this one. You know, Kenny Pickett's play, like you said, out of structure early on was good inside the pocket, missing a high consistently over the middle and ugly stat line overall, 13 and 29 for a buck 95 uh, through a touchdown, the one to George Pickens and no interceptions, only one sack. So the pass rush of Cleveland, Miles Garrett, pretty quiet in this game overall, second half. Running the ball well, Najee Harris continues to run hard. 23 carries, 84 yards, a touchdown. Jalen Warren, six carries, 36 yards. Uh, had a, a key third down reception as well. Some of the Jet receiver run game working, fullback game. Garner Hayward getting a touch. Um, all those things combined. Again, very much team effort, very much spread the ball around. That's how Pittsburgh's won the back half of the year. Look, I thought overall, I, you know, I, I didn't have a lot of issue with the play calling overall. I don't feel, I just, I feel that uh, Kenny... I think a lot, you know, most of their problems, uh, uh, I, I felt was picket in structure as opposed to, he, he made some plays out of structure and Warren, you know, one of those ones that he kind of uh, dumped off, uh, to, uh, to Warren, what a great play, uh, Warren made, uh, after get that, getting that and making a fry. I, I'm surprised. I didn't think he made the first down. Uh, I thought he got, got kind of a generous spot on that, but, mm-hmm. uh, uh, you know, they, they've got a nice find and Warren. I, I just think most of the offensive problems that this team had just in general overall, uh, you know, can, can maybe be related to Kenny Pickett in this game. But and, and no, that's not I don't I don't think Kenny Pickett should be cut. No, I don't. But I mean, we got we, we promised we would look at this on a on a, you know, on a game by game basis and then, mm-hmm. you know, kind of carry it from there. But uh, I didn't think it was his best game. I thought he did make some plays out of structure. I just. I think he kind of lacked in structure. Sure. I think it was certainly a couple steps down from the Baltimore game uh, just last week. And so not the best note to go out on, but overall, you know, start to finish the incursions there. And, and really that's, that's the main picture of this game. Now knowing it, it doesn't matter for Pittsburgh's playoff hopes. The young guys, I think, you know, pick it aside, playing well, contributing Harris, Warren, Connor Hayward, a couple of clutch third down catches late in that game. One, Something about him down the seam. I think Tyler Weiss had the cut of every catch down the seam is the same reception for Hayward. It was high over his head, reaching back, but he's got great hands. Uh, Even going uh, back to preseason, right? Or yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, Third and eight slant after that great catch down the seam for I think twenty-seven yards to to move the sticks and set up the Derek Watt touchdown. George Pickens, that back shoulder throw was unstoppable. I don't know how you defend that as a Mm -hmm. corner as a defense. I mean, it's tough just in general. Then you have a guy like Pickens that just makes, and he should have had, I think, another one too that they ruled him out of bounds on. Very questionable there again. The theme of the day for the officiating, but all those young guys really just kind of summarizing the play and the growth of this offense from the first game of the year to where they're at now. Not where you want to be, but again, encouraged, optimistic, heading into the new year. And look, I mean, who, 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 you know, that played a lot of snaps on offense this year, uh, 
isn't going to be back next year. You, know, you got Zach Gentry, who's going to be an unrestricted free agent, but it's not it's not unthinkable to think that uh, he might be resigned, re resigned, right? I mean, uh, all of your offensive line, I believe, is under contract, right? You know, uh, right. your your starting guys, uh, your running backs, both your running backs in 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 Jalen Warren and Najee Harris, obviously under contract. Pickett's obviously under contract. Uh, two of your uh, your two top receivers uh, in, in in Deontay Johnson and uh, George Pickens, obviously under contract. Uh, you don't even know what you have in in in, in Calvin Austin the third yet. Uh, we'll see. You know, what, you know who you're missing. You're, uh, you're missing. Primus, the, yeah. No, no, you're missing the ace of the hole, Derek Watts, a third oh, down specialist. Oh, He's yeah. a free agent, so yeah. there's your one free agent. Well, look, I mean, if they bring him <laughs> back, it's not. I mean, uh, he, even if he doesn't, I I think he's. He's just not, you know, he's not all the, all that as a lead back. I, I don't think, uh, you know, as a lead fullback, as a blocking fullback, you know, they, they found a way to use him. Look, he was used more this year than he's been used. I think <laughs> in the, in the previous two seasons, right. You know, Oh yeah. Uh, uh, sure. o- overall with all that said, I'm not knocking myself to pay him three or $4 million to come back either. You know? Yeah. My, it, my tongue was in my cheek on that. Carver. I got you. I got you. Uh, but I mean, o- outside of that, I mean, you're, you know, uh, uh, Firemuth and Connor Hayward. I mean, all of this is, you know, for the most part, the, the main nucleus, a large part of the, the, the nucleus of this thing is going to be back in, mm-hmm. in, 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 in 2023. In fact, maybe, maybe all damn near all of it, you know, because like I said, I think good, good chance that Gentry's resigned. Right. Pretty much the whole group's going to come back. And so that is the, the blessing that is the curse of having that young and kind of new offenses that first year, all the going pains, leads and lends itself to buy year two once you get past that stuff everybody's here everybody's on a reasonable contract and you can really grow and hopefully take big steps forward next year so that's the, that's the theme of the offense overall we've talked about that for a while the changes that do occur with this team there will be some changes offensively potentials for upgrades certainly but in terms of free agents guys going the real meaty things to talk about come before march it's all on defense it's it's bush it's Edmonds, it's sutton Ogan Joby, Warmly, et cetera. So that's really where a lot of the free agency discussion will begin is all the guys that may stay, may go on defense. And look, I, you know, Kenny's obviously comfortable. He knows what to expect now, knows what uh, knows what life in the NFL as a quarterback, as a starting quarterback's like. Even after the game, he talked about how he's going to get these guys together at some point during the offseason. And boy, that's uh, you always like to hear that when a season comes to an end. And uh you know, I, really the big question now is who's going to be the offensive coordinator of this game. Yeah. I was just going to say, I guess the one guy offensively you don't know if he'll be back is the OC in Mac Canada. So I guess we can kind of, you want to fold in Tomlin's comments on Monday, of course, asked about Canada's status and his thoughts on Canada overall and said basically that, that he thought Canada got better just in the way the offense got better, said it was encouraging, but declined to commit to Canada returning or decline, really declined to commit to, to any coach staying or going, didn't want to talk about personnel, very expected and non-answer there from Mike Tomlin. But um, how do you, how do you read Tomlin's comments about things <laughs> getting better, encouraging you can kind of take this one or two ways? I don't know how anybody can take, I, I think it's, I think people are forming opinions by just how they want the narrative to go or how their narrative has been up until this point. Uh, I, I don't have a clue. I, I, I cannot, tell you uh one way or the other which way i think there i guess if 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 forced to pick a side here of which way i think it might go i think i'd be 51 percent canada returning 49 percent him uh him not returning uh i i don't i don't I mean has mike tomlin ever come out and said you know what this guy's safe or that guy's safe you no. know no of course we, we did not expect that today i think Again, if you made me choose, as you just said, are these comments from Tomlin more likely, more encouraging that Canada returns or or more likely Canada's gone? I would lean towards they're more likely indicating that Canada returns. But as Tomlin said, and as things can change, th- this team, I think Tomlin's comment was, we don't keep up with the Joneses. We don't make our decisions the first day after the offseason. And so I went back and looked. Randy Feetner wasn't let go until I think it was four days after the season ended. Uh, Todd Haley was five days. So give it to the end of the week and maybe we'll have some more clarity on Canada's situation. Uh, look, I mean, I, I, you would think sooner rather than later, they'd make the decision on this, right? 
Well, it's about, like I said, four or five days seems to be the timetable there. So by Friday, I would say. Okay. I mean, that's, so you, that's the history of it. So you, uh, uh, you, you would think by the end, by, by Friday, then we should know something. I mean, again, every or, situation's different and you have Omar Khan. I mean, I, I think Art Rooney, Rooney obviously plays a big role in deciding these things. So I can't guarantee things as we can enter this brave new world of the Khan Weidel regime. But I, I would assume if we don't hear anything by Friday afternoon, then I'm going to start working under the assumption that Canada will be the OC next year. Okay. Uh, anything else from this game here, offense, defense? Um, any other thoughts from from this one? Oh, wow. Uh, 20 interceptions for this defense. I mean, they yeah. didn't always play great, but they took the ball away consistently. And, the, boy, they started to stack up the, the sacks. Uh, they almost hit 50 the hard way, huh? <laughs> <laughs> it's got to play clean. Something about playing the Browns in a regular season finale is just the uh, medicine for the Steelers. Right, defense. right. Uh, I, I mean, I think. I think we did see some progress, you know, overall on offense, but once again, I, I, I just, I view it more as just uh, perfecting, you know, the, the, the blow below average in this overall there. I mean, there, there's no doubt that uh, this offensive line playing together and staying healthy and boy, take a snapshot of that, man. Mm -hmm. You had three players play every offensive snap, uh, this season in Dan Moore Jr., Kevin Dotson, and uh, James, James Daniel. Daniels, Jan Daniel, uh, and you had one guy in Chiquama Core Four play all but one snap, and uh, all 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 five of them started all seventeen games. Seriously, uh, take a snapshot of that because it's. Uh, that's how how rare that is, and I think the byproduct of that is they they did kind of have that cohesiveness as the season went on, and Pat Myers, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, teaching uh, scheme and, and what he wanted to do did stick because he had all those guys in there, and I think once Najee Harris, you know, got into that second half of the season and was 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 uh, you know out of that steel plate in his shoe or what have you uh and not having to carry you know carry you know not be the main lead lead bell cow all that time i think all that stuff kind of combined together uh resulted in this in, in 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 you know this team having an identity as a run game and uh that that was good to see because they if they didn't have that they weren't going to do anything uh and right. we said as much coming out of the coming out of the shoot here that this team needed to to uh to run the football first and foremost and they did so uh you know uh i do think that they have to still draft an offensive lineman or two just to be to have them in in the fold there and you never never know when you're going to need one there but uh going back once again i you know the nucleus of this offense is going to uh, stay in stay intact here and i know a lot of people probably don't want to hear it but that might be your starting five offensive line come week one of the season i think for as much as we talk about the x's and the o's and the schematics and all, all those things are important Oftentimes, the teams that succeed, the teams that grow, the teams that win Super Bowls are the teams who stay healthy. I mean, that's just kind of what it comes down to in Pittsburgh, being healthy the second half of the year, not really suffering any major injuries to key core guys. Obviously, the difference of losing TJ Watt versus having him, Nashi Harris getting healthy, the O-line being healthy. Here's my concern with the offensive line, though, being healthy is this team better not get too comfortable with that because I doubt it's going to happen next year to have right. every single lineman play every single game. And them essentially outside of Mason Cole, missing a half of action several weeks ago, many weeks ago, um, you know, the offensive line didn't miss time. That's not going to happen again. And the depth this year felt very questionable. And fortunately was never really needed to be tested. Um, but expecting that to occur again in 2023 is a, a risky bet. Right. That's why I, I, I mean, we've done this a long time now. I mean, remember a couple of years ago or several years ago, it seemed like it was a different starting offensive line combination uh, every week, uh, probably a little bit longer than that. Back when Ligurski, you know, I think uh, I had a chart running weekly of, uh, of uh, you know, like 12 different starting offensive line combinations and, 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 and all that kind of stuff there. So uh, it was a rarity and I wouldn't, I will be very surprised if you come close to what happened with this offensive line 
uh, in the next five years, let alone next season. Uh, there, I hope I'm wrong, obviously, because, it, mm-hmm. you know, because uh, I think we saw a byproduct of them being able to stay healthy was what happened. But with, like I said, with, within all that, I, you know, I think you got to go out and, you know, uh, and, and it might not be in the first or second round here, but I think it's the you know, middle of the draft here. You got to take regardless of the position. I think, I think you have to take the best offensive lineman that you'd like there, or that has, a, that is available there. And maybe even two at some point during this draft, because, uh, I think just the law of averages and odds mm-hmm. tells you that you're going to have to test your offensive line depth in 2023. And Mike Tomlin, rightfully so, gave a shout out to Pat Meyer and the job that he's done. I know that was a questionable hire. I think I even called it average whenever they made the hire, um, you know, way back when before the year began. But I think Meyer's been a really good presence and uh, leader and teacher for this group. Not not really yeller, not kind of the, you know, get in your face kind of guy, but really just repetition, teaching technique. And I think Pat Meyer, that's been really good for young offensive line to, to really get back to basics and fundamentals. And once those guys got comfortable and bought in with the more aggressive on body pass sets and things like that, uh, you really saw the results, um, you know, on the field and this team really produced, but let's kind of fully transition. All right, to, real, real quick. Sure. Do you, do you think Canada will be back and should Canada be back? Like you said in my article today, I, I first thing I wanted to write about for this Monday morning was Steelers season is over and Matt Canada watch begins. Um, I am, as we talked about Friday, slightly leaning. I'm kind of in your 51, 49. I'll say, you know, arbitrary numbers, 55% chance he comes back. I think Mike Tomlin's comments today are a bit more positive t- towards those odds than than reducing those odds. Should he come back? Again, I think the first six weeks were really brutal. I think it got a lot better from from then. My my gripes and my critiques became a lot less um, on Matt Canada, on the game plan. But do I think Matt Canada is really the guy to elevate this offense into a top group that's going to be required in these, this AFC with so many great quarterbacks and schemes? No. So I'd rather rip, rip that Band-Aid off early than doing it a year from two or a year or two from now. So I personally would move on from Matt Canada. Yeah. what do you think about the way Mike Tomlin answered, uh, 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 you know, we, we were what, what we needed in so many, in so many words, you know, he's saying that, you know, the, the offense was kind of simple, dumbed down. Yeah. I like that's not a revelation. I mean, we all kind of see this offense became run heavy and conservative. and, and, And like I said before, the one, one key reason why this team turned the season around, I know it's this dumb cliche that kind of gets memed about sometimes is, but it's the old adage of to win a game, you first have to not lose it. And this offense is getting really good at losing football games in the first half of the season with turnovers and just really inefficient play overall. And avoiding that was, you know, 70% 70% of the battle the second half of the season, just simply not turning the football over and winning time of possession. And their third down success went from one of the worst in football the first half of the year to the best in football the second half of the season. Really remarkable there, tied into the success the run game had. So, yeah, it was a simple offense because it, it kind of had to be, and, and that was, was what was required to win games, as Mike Tomlin said. Well, he says, uh, he was asking, what, ph- philosophically, were you guys a little conservative by design due to relatively uncertainty with skilled position people and with the next step be, you know, more splash and, 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 and a little more, you know, putting the pedal to the metal, I guess he says succinctly. Yes. You guys know that I'm a fundamentalist when I, when I've got red paint, I paint my born red uh, coaching cliche. What you saw from us was what was appropriate, particularly over the second half of the year. And then you got, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, so many words saying that, you know, I mean, I, I hearken back to, uh, Duck Hodges when he was in there, you know, <laughs> we don't want our quarterback to lose us the game, you know, right. And, yeah. but, but, and, and if that's the, if that's what, what the direct order is, then was it Matt Canada just following directions? Well, I mean, I think the offense, the offense was not that complex to start the year. I mean, it's always been pretty simple. I mean, maybe it was. Right, down but I mean, it was, it was, it was new people though, anyway, you know, and, sure. and, and I guess that was the, that was, you know, uh, because he was asked, you know, relative uncertainty with your skilled possession people, because you had a new wide receiver in there and Pickens, you had, you know, pick a quarterback, you know, not named Mason Rudolph, uh, uh, Trubisky or, 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 or Pickett, uh, 
young kid in, uh, in, in, in Connor Hayward, you know, a, a, a new young running back in Jalen Warren, although he didn't, you know, it was mostly Najee Harris to start, uh, kind of a, a new center, a new center there in Mason Cole, new guard. You see what I'm saying there? So I don't think it's sure. just, I don't think it, I don't think the question was just designed it just because it's a, a rookie quarterback in there. You know, I, I I'm, I'm honestly asking, you know, and look, I, 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 you know, the, the, the end game with my answer is still along the lines with yours, but, uh, you know, I'm just wondering, you know, how much of a directive was there in there to, to Matt Canada's like, just keep it, keep it simple. And let's, let's master a below average offense instead of trying to put too much on, on the, my biggest fear with Matt Canada is how much more complex can he be, you know, mm-hmm. uh, switch routes, uh, uh, so, you know, uh, you know, more, more things that you see these other offenses around the league and you go, man, <laughs> sure wish the Steelers ran something like that, you know? Uh, and, and I'm with you. I, I don't, I don't see him as it. I see him as a plain Jane, uh, offensive guy. Uh, just, he puts the lipstick on the pig with all the motion and, and, and that's it. And when we talk about Canada's job, this isn't just about what he did this year it's about last year too it's where things weren't and now you could argue the newness of it and him being a first time oc but eventually you have to stop making excuses for the guy and just you can still judge i think canada's body of work even knowing the obstacles and constraints of of the offense as it was structured this year as mike tomlin later said he was asked can you evaluate canada despite all the hurdles and newness of this offense and mike tomlin said you know I'm paid to do the tricky things. And so I think you can still analyze Canada and the job that he did, even knowing and that being couched in kind of the unique season that was this offense. Tricky, with new tricky, quarterbacks. tricky, tricky. <laughs> I have no idea that what that's run, referencing. Run, uh, uh, run, run, run DMC, right? <laughs> You're asking the wrong person, uh, okay. the wrong decade of, of someone who was born. Uh, so I take, I'll take your word for it. it but it's, again, it's, it's run DMC. That's a, it's tricky song. All right. I'm showing my right. age here. You are a lot today. Um, but it's, again, you can it's still tricky to rock a rhyme to rock a rhyme. That's right on time. It's tricky. It's tricky. Oh, oh anyway. that one. Okay. I'm, I'm anyway, catching the tune. Yeah. That, I got, that, I got that, the chorus. That's right where my mind went when he was talking about. <laughs> that's that's your mind I, I know. I just, I stay in, uh, I stay locked in the eighties, I think a lot of times, uh, but that was, that was running through my head as soon as, uh, as soon as he said, tricky, half the people so, listening will get that. Well, probably not even half, probably a third of that will, will, will get my it's tricky reference. And the other two thirds are like, man, I wish they would just get on with it. I'm waiting for your thoughts on Bubby Brewster and Mark Malone with kind of the, the way this thing's going today. Mm-hmm. But um, again, bottom line on Canada, again, you can talk about some of the, the things he had to deal with and the offense getting better. And it certainly did. Um, is it enough to me? He's like, he's like the Devin Bush of coordinators where it wasn't better. <laughs> yeah, it was better. Is it good enough though? Is it really what you want long-term now? Uh, there, I mean, long story short, you know, you wouldn't expect this team to, you know, maybe score, maybe a couple more points. Uh, I, I would think, think over can can uh, no let me fa- let me phrase it this way can this team can this team team win a super bowl in 2023 when matt canada is the offensive coordinator i don't want to say that he's the reason why they can't i think it's probably bigger i think it comes down to quarterback play really can can he pick it when a super bowl in 2023 is to me the more relevant type question but i don't see this offense ever being prolific or even top 10 right. with matt canada running it and I understand in its current form, it kind of had to be what it had to be. And, you know, I think we saw this back in Ben in 04, very run heavy for a couple of years. And it opened up as, you know, Ben established himself and um, he got more confidence in him. And I think the same will happen with Kenny Pickett. So I think everyone would understand that you can't run the ball 40 times in this era and expect to, to win Super Bowls. But it was required to, you know, win games this year. And so you would expect this offense to evolve. Um, that's a long winded way of saying that I don't, I don't want to put again, put it all squarely on Canada, but do I think he's the guy that's the long-term guy that's going to really maximize his offense? I don't. But, uh, uh, for those scoring at home, uh, and I'm sure you're all concerned about it. Ian Rappaport seems to think that, uh, based on, on the way Matt, uh, Mike Tomlin worded things today that, uh, that he'll be back, that Matt Canada will be back. And then you got beat writers saying the way that uh, uh, Mike Tomlin phrased things today, that uh, that 
probably some changes are coming in. In other words, Matt Canada won't be back. So there, there you go. I, I, I don't have a damn clue. Yeah, we'll see. I think Rappaport, he wasn't reporting, right? It was just kind of no, his, no, it was his, his, his estimation. Spe- spe- guest of guest, guest relation. Yeah, spec reporting, I think is what spe- I like to call spec it. Spec reporting, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, well, again, I think by Friday, to me, generally it's four or five days as team reviews things. That's been the timeline for when was Keith Butler officially let go last year? I didn't look that up. When did he um, officially the whole parted ways with, which again goes back to Canada's contract. Is he under contract? Is he not? Well, that that's you know. a key thing here too. It is. It, yeah. it, 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 and I don't have, I, I've looked and looked and I, I can't find the answer on that. And I, I reached out to Joel Corey even to say, Joel, do you know if uh, Matt Canada is technically under contract for 2023? He says he does not know. And he does not have a way to find out of knowing. Uh, okay. either there and logically he should be we don't know that for a fact but the the tea leaves would say he is okay based on based on the fact he became oc in 2021 and generally in pittsburgh three coordinators years, right? are three-year deals that randy feetner was let go after the three-year deal expired todd haley signed two three-year deals six years in pittsburgh and then because they never fire they part ways right. with contracts aren't renewed i think it's partly we just don't want to spend the money on fired guys and partly just kind of the way pittsburgh does business. So th- that's why I think now, does that guarantee that Canada stays if he's under contract for next year? No, but it's a pretty relevant right. piece of information. This team has not fired a coordinator postseason since 2003, which is quite a bit of history. Right. But we just, we don't, we can't say for sure. Right. We cannot, by the way, Keith Butler retired six days after uh, last season. So again, that's not that four five, six day timeline based on when coordinators exit Pittsburgh. Okay. Uh, what else to Mike Tomlin here uh, speaking of, we actually, I don't want to bury the lead here talking about Brian Flores and on his own volition mentioned that Brian Flores had already gotten an, an interview request for a coordinator position, declined to say uh, what team that was. But right after that, I think Adam Schefter heard that and went right to work and said, that's the Cleveland Browns who put in the interview request as their uh, to be their next DC after the team uh, fired Joe Woods uh, today. And so Flores already, uh, has not been, I guess, officially accepted by Pittsburgh. I assume that it will. I think it almost has to be. Uh, but Flores will interview interview for the DC job in Cleveland. Yeah, and 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 if he, you know, if he doesn't get that, he's probably going to have a couple of interviews this off season, I would think. Yeah, it was tricky for me because there's still the legal situation and how do teams view him. I'm, if I had to guess, I don't think Flores will be a head coach next year. I think much stronger odds he'd be a DC somewhere. I just, you know, we'll have to see um, how many jobs become available. I know the Browns are interviewing already uh, several names, including I think Gerard Mayo and Jim Schwartz is going to be interviewed. So they're going to go through a, a long list of people. Um, you know, but we'll see what happens with Flores. I mean, he's probably not going to be a head coach again until he's a defensive coordinator first. Yeah, that makes sense. I think also until the legal stuff from the NFL, right, right. or wrong, probably they're not going to hire him until that's all officially settled. Right. So we'll, we'll have to see how that uh, I, I don't have a clue how that's going to play out either, but I would expect him to get, you know, be included in, you know, to, to, to get interviewed, you know, a few times here. Sure. But will he be hired is the question. And you know, we'll just have to, to wait and see on that. Um, I'm trying to get any other, maybe coaching. Devin changes. Bush. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. I was going to just mention, I'm just trying to, to, in my own head, think about who could go. We don't know contracts and, and that type of stuff. Danny Smith eventually may have to retire. It's always a question. Um, you guys know how I feel about Danny Smith, Danny Smith forever, but he is uh, getting up there in age. Uh, I, you know, I, I think somewhere, somewhere on the staff, there might be a change, you know, whether it be someone getting hired away like Florida sure. or something. Uh, you know, once again, it makes it hard being to not be able to sit here and run down the list of whose contracts are up and all like that. Uh, uh, I will, I'll, I'll say this, uh, I will be surprised if there's, uh, uh, zero changes on the staff here. I mean, what, you know, is Eddie Faulkner is, his, is, is his deal up and, you know, I think I, he's under through next year because positional coaches signed two year deals. Okay. So I want to say he re-upped, I'd have to, I'll have to check. You can kind of uh, parse this stuff out there. I think if I went back through it and took the time. All right. Well, I think uh, once again, I think I'll be surprised if the entire coaching staff remains the same. All right. I should mention just really quickly, if Canada is fired, I would assume that Matt Tom show will go as well, considering Tom show has basically follow Canada at every stop he's made in college. And so those guys seem to be uh, uh, you know, both, both and they're both. Uh, so what am I trying to say here? They're uh, joined. Help at me out here, yeah. Join at the hip. Thank you very much. Um, so if, if Canada is gone, I would expect Tom show to go as well. Okay. 
All right. As you mentioned, Devin Bush, let me get myself back on track here. Mike Tomlin asked, uh, you know, why didn't Devin Bush, you know, really play in this game? Just five snaps all came in the first half. And uh, Tomlin said not health related game plan specific. And I think you had the perfect tweet for it, Dave. Last two weeks, Bush has played 10 snaps against Baltimore and Cleveland. Devin Bush not built to play AFC North ball. Plain and simple. That's what it comes down to. And uh, look, I mean, uh, what did we see, uh, especially in the second half of the season, uh, a little bit better Devin Bush, at least a more physical Devin Bush uh, uh, taking on blocks and those kind of things? Yes, we did. Uh, was it good enough? No, it was not. And uh, <laughs> you get into crunch time in AFC ball in your final two games of the season. And De- uh, Devin Bush is uh, 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 limited to five snaps in each of those games. Uh, that tells you, and it's not, and my, Mike Tomlin said it was not a, uh, uh, not a health related decision. Uh, I don't know what else more you need at that point there. Uh, close the book on Devin Bush. Look, uh, might you re-sign him for a minimum for, uh, on, on a veteran, uh, minimum deal, just, just, you know, to bring him to camp to see what happens and all. Sure, that's possible, but uh, I think another team is going to 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 be willing to take uh, a chance on Devin Bush for a, for a slightly more than minimum, and that slightly more than the minimum will be too rich for the Steelers' blood. Uh, and I think it's time to Artie Burns him. Yeah, Devin Bush is gone. Full stop. It just he's not going to come back. Even for I think a minimum scenario where you know financially wouldn't hurt you really at all. I wouldn't even do that. Just wipe he's your not going to help you on special team. No. Even even if you brought him back on a minimum on a veteran benefit contract with a reduced salary cap at this point, and with the assumption that he's not going to be your starting line, you know, going to be a reserve. Does he give you enough on special teams to even warrant carrying? For any reason. And the answer that's no. Right. He doesn't. And, and so just let him go. Move on. Didn't work out. Made the aggressive move in 2019 for the ACL for a variety of reasons. Just just didn't work. Move on. They're going to resign Robert Spillane. We'll see about Marcus Allen. You know, Jack, I think, will probably be carried, although I think his status is a little questionable just given the injuries and, and, and not having a great season overall. But to the to the point, Devin Bush, he's, he played his last snap in Pittsburgh. I think so. So, um, yeah, when you're when you're losing snaps to a seventh round rookie against the Browns and the that Ravens, doesn't and he knows, only, that doesn't really know what he's doing. But he, right. And he only played against the Browns. Bush did because Jack got hurt. He wasn't in the right. game plan at all. And that was still only five snaps. So basically, he was supposed to he was not in the game plan at all against the, uh, the Ravens and then barely in it against Baltimore. And you got Robert Splane playing every snap. Yeah, Splane's coming back. I don't know what the numbers will be. <laughs> They're going to resign Robert Splane. You're probably right. Yeah. Uh, what else from Mike Tomlin here? I think those were those were all the headliney type things. I know that yesterday Kim Hayward post game had some questionable comments about his future with the team. Said basically, well, that's up to management, and I don't know what the future holds. I want to be back, but you never never can can say that with certainty. Tomlin. Well, asked about well they that tried today. to take that one down to the next town, didn't they? And back. Well, the thing is, Hayward said this last year, too. So I, I last year, I think my alarm bells went up. This year, I went, OK, he just kind of always says that. And Tomlin said, you know, that's just how Hayward's wired. He's humble, takes nothing for granted. Basically, pay it no mind. Hayward will be back. Yeah, just crappy, think, crappy media trying to escalate that. Yes. Well, I, I, I get the headline. It looks like if you hadn't if you didn't realize the context of what he said last year, then I, I get that. But um, at, at what, no what, point did, at any point when that stuff was filtering out last night, did I think to myself, Hmm. I wonder if Cameron Hayward will be back in 2023. Well, I think the question is about retirement at his age. It's not about I, what the Steelers want him back it. and cut him. Yeah, I, I wasn't either because I knew about what he said last year. I think the more interesting conversation with Kim Hayward is we talked so much coming into this year about TJ Watt, new franchise sack leader. Kim Hayward has more sacks than TJ Watt. He's uh, what two sacks away from tying James Harrison's mark. I think Watt is is now three behind. So Kim Hayward now has the second most sacks in Steelers history, which is crazy. Third time in his NFL career hit the double digit number as well, too. I mean, yeah, this, first this, this guy halfway through the season, people were, were saying, is, is Cameron Hayward done? <laughs> you know, <laughs> no, he ain't done. Uh, just, uh, I mean, look, I mean, that, that, that whole, look, what a season by Alex Highsmith too, man. I yeah. mean, uh, I, 
you got to pay that guy this off season. I mean, he's already going to get a bump in pay due to the uh, proven performance escalator and all like that. Uh, I think you got to lock that kid up, man. And then, you know, obviously you still got to address, address uh, the depth and you can do that during, you know, in, in the draft and all like that. Uh, but, uh, you know, good, I mean, really good season by Cameron Hayward and, 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 and Alex Highsmith. And really they finished with a flurry there uh, against yeah. the, against the Browns as well, too. Literally. They sure did. 14 and a half sacks for Alex Highsmith. We really, said we really wanted impressive. to hit the double digit. What, what did we say? 12, weren't we saying maybe he could hit uh, 12 or, or, or 10? I think it was or, at eight to 10. I think it was the number yeah. I pegged him at. But yeah, but we that said we wanted to see him hit the double digit number and, and take that next step. And he did it, man. He he really did. He's a formable, uh, formable outside you know, edge edge guy, I think, in the NFL right now. Did it in style. My favorite stat of the weird of all the stats of the weird the entire season. Kim Hayward had a uh, had a sack on the first snap of the season. Kim Hayward had a sack on the last snap there of the season. So I love the symmetry there. Also, I am very mad, Dave, at the Pittsburgh Steelers home clock operator because Kim Hayward sacked Deshaun Watson with two seconds left. And I wanted to get one last victory formation in there just uh... to see where the guys would line up there. And they just let the clock roll and and ended the game. So I'm extremely upset about that. <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> what else are Mike Tomlin? Again, those seem to be the, the big things. He um asked about William Jackson, his future status. Tom basically saying, listen, guys, the season ended less than 24 hours ago. I have no idea. Although I think the numbers just tell you he's not coming back. Certainly not at his current number with the roster bonus due in March. No, there would have to be some serious work with a pen and, and paper. Uh, and scissors. Between, and, and, <laughs> need yeah, scissors for and scissors uh, uh, between now and 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 March fifteenth for him to to be on this roster. Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean he William Jackson basically have to agree to take the NFL minimum, and he's probably going to say cut me, and I'll see what's out there uh, first and foremost. So it's very very hard to imagine. Uh, uh, as soon as William Jackson gets healthy, assuming he's about there because he he had that window the practice window open up and all uh if he he's i you don't even let that i i don't even let him walk down the stairs by himself to be honest <laughs> with you uh because I, I can't afford for him to get injured uh i i go ahead and send him out the door as soon as possible here yeah he takes the elevator with a bad back i'm not risking stairs you kidding me uh by the way sorry to interrupt here but it's a very important and, and good news update the more hamlin has been discharged from the hospital is returning home to buffalo so wow, just after Lord. But a week ago, right? Yeah, it was one mm-hmm. week ago. And so that's uh, incredible there and a lot of support. And uh, the Bills returning the opening kickoff against the Patriots for a touchdown. Just just wild stuff. Gives me chills talking about it right now. But back to Mike Tomlin, two more things I wanted to hit on. Um, an obvious statement basically said that, you know, wish that Chris Boswell, this team would have made more field goals. Obviously, Boss had the groin injury. And so that probably impacted him to some degree, but said this team has to put the ball through the upright more uh, next season. Absolutely. And they'll, they'll, they'll look at that though. Uh, exit meetings, uh, obviously going on, uh, I mean, usual end of the season stuff now at this point, I think, uh, do you, what, what was your take on Mike Tomlin saying that he had no regrets over the, uh, handling of the quarterback situation all year, kind of gave himself some wiggle room and said, I'll have to think about it some more, but said he had no regrets. And I think about what's that mean? No re- regrets or whatever that, uh, that thing is. That was my thought. Do you have any any issues with how Mike Tomlin handled the quarterback room from start to finish back from the spring till now? Well, look, uh, uh, the criticism I have is, is it, 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 it wasn't the competition. It wasn't a competition at all. No, no matter what he tried to say or however he tried to frame it or, or whatnot, it never, it never was a competition. Yeah. To, to, to start the year. No, it was always right. Trubisky's job. Yeah. You know, and, and he, you know, he tried to, try to make it seem like it, 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 you know, it wasn't that, I mean, you know, just, I don't, I don't know why you can't, why you try to run from that, you know, uh, you know, just playing this up, just come out and say, we, 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 we went went outside Trubisky. We wanted him to be our starting quarterback until he was not going to be our starting quarterback. Uh, I still think that this team uh, should have traded Mason Rudolph, even if it, uh, were to be for some pizza coupons and, mm-hmm. and, and what have you, because why not get it now 
Uh, he's not going to get a big deal. You know, e- even if, if, if Mason Rudolph leaves and it somehow factors into, comp- into compensatory formula, that's not going to be until the year after, right? So why not why not have, have done it uh, this year? They, they knew damn, damn good and well that you know, it, it would have taken a lot to get to the point uh, where, where Mason Rudolph had to play. And if you get to that point anyway, <laughs> you're at that point anyway. And I, to, to me, it didn't make a lot of sense. Uh, I, I would have dealt once again, and I don't know what they got. I would imagine that maybe at least they could have dealt him for his sixth or seventh round pick. Uh, and if that's the best they could have got from Mason Rudolph, they should have dealt them away. And it just, it was, it to the whole, the whole thing was a sham the whole, whole time, you know, whole time through, uh, there. And, you know, and, and in fact, I kind of questioned when they did pull the plug at on Trubisky at that point, but, mm-hmm. uh, just because of, it was weird timing. And if D De- if Deontay Johnson catches that ball in the back of the end zone, does mm-hmm. it get pulled? Probably not, and who knows what happens the rest of the season from there. Right, right. No, That's the point. Not, not, and, and that uh, is, it, and that, look, I still felt that the change was probably going to be made around the bye week there. It just ended up having to happen a couple of weeks early there, but uh, the whole thing just seemed like a, sh- a sham anyway. Would it have mattered in the whole grand scheme of things here? Probably not. So if you're going to look at it that, I'd much rather them get Kenny Pickett more time you know, under center, like they did. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, if you would have fast forward me to this point, uh, and I would have woke up from, from a coma or something, I would have said, well, you know, was at least Kenny Pickett able to play a bunch, you know, in 2022. And if you would have said, yeah, look, he, he was in there really since, you know, uh, the jets game, I would say, well, okay, well, there's that, you know, uh, but it, it you know, I don't know if there, are there any rag rats in there? <laughs> uh, probably not. Just other than the fact that he should have called the spade a spade right out of the chute. Sure. Nothing major, nothing damaging, nothing we're going to really be talking about two, three years from now. I think for because Mike Tomlin, since being hired in 07, has done literally everything there is to do as a head coach, except for handling a new quarterback situation, a first round guy versus the veteran, because he always had been. He was you know in that position where he inherited a you know, Super Bowl winning quarterback the day that he got hired, something most coaches aren't in position to do. So given that you would expect maybe some growing pains, even for for Tomlin handling that situation, would I have traded Mason Rudolph? Yes, I understand why they didn't. I'm not going to complain about it too much. Um, I thought pulling Trubisky at halftime against the Jets was sudden and unexpected. But in hindsight, as you said, give Pickett more chances to play, to work through his growing pains. Because let's say, just in this, we never can say this with certainty, but let's say the Pickett didn't get his first start until week 10 post by would he have gotten to the point of seeing the encouraging signs the way that we did right now, or would have the rest of the season been working through those growing pains and not really getting to come out the other side, the way that he did say the last three, four games of the season. Um, so there's value in playing that guy early because a, I think Pickett was ready and B to kind of work through the struggles and, and get better and improve and, and have this encouraging feeling we have right now entering 2023. Well, right, right. And like, like I said, at, at no point before going into my coma, would, would I have been under the impression that this team would have had a shot to make the playoffs. So coming out, I would, you would say, well, they, you know, it, they made it close. They, uh, they came down to believe it or not. They, they were, they were rooting for Joe Flacco and the jets. And I would have really thought something. Yeah, would. You were like, what year did I wake up? In? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> first, after I got over that shock first, I, yeah. uh, I probably would ask, well, did Kenny Pickett play a lot, you know, and, and, and did he make progress? You say, yeah, he did. And yes, he did. I would say, okay, all right, well, uh, good to be back. <laughs> That's how the conversation would have gone. All right, let's get out of here. Let's get yeah, lunch. Put, put on some running these run, run, yeah, run DMC. And, yeah. and some where's my Frampton comes to light. See how I'm <laughs> able to tie all this up in, into a bow for you here and bring it all back. Uh uh where's my Frampton comes alive album here. <laughs> uh uh all right. Uh seemed like there was something else we was I was gonna ask about uh uh, no, I, I mean, I think we, we, we got, Oh, what'd you think about Mitch Trubisky's comments that surfaced over the, Oh, oh yeah. Uh, over the weekend here. 
Yeah, I, I've always appreciate when athletes are honest, even if it might you know lead to some criticism, which I'm sure that it did just from the general Twitter public. But Mitch Trubisky talking to ESPN, basically saying that I regret signing as quickly as I did. He signed the first day of free agency. He was, I think, the first signing of free agency. You know, once it became official on March 11th, whatever day that was, um, to sign with Pittsburgh. And so Trubisky saying that it just happened so fast, and I made a decision, and basically saying he regrets. He says he regrets signing. That immediately with Pittsburgh, I think that basically means I regret signing with Pittsburgh, period. <laughs> uh, that's the way I kind of took it. Uh, yeah. what's, what's go, uh, what do you do with that eight? I mean, here, 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 here's the pushback on it. Well, where are you going to go? Are you going to be able to go out and get another backup quarterback uh, for eight million, you know, uh, for eight million dollars or less? And, and uh, the simple answer is yes, I think. But uh I, he's probably going to ask them, look, can y'all send me on my way? Uh, although I don't know. I mean, if, if Mitch Trubisky was released tomorrow, all right, mm-hmm. can, could he get a deal? Could he get $8 million in his pocket for 2023? Now he might have to sign, you know, he might, that might be a take home. He might have to sign a three year deal to get that $8 million total, meaning base salary and signing bonus put together. But could he go out and get $8 million at least put in his bank account in 2023? Probably not, although you have to understand the cap's going to go up and prices go up. But, you know, could he get as much as he did last year relative to the cap? I doubt it. I mean, he was this is supposed to be the resurgent year that he spends a year in Buffalo. He's the great veteran backup, the great person for Josh Allen to kind of lean on a little bit and revive his career and. This was supposed to be Mitch Trubisky's resurgence, the, the prove it ish, although it was a two year deal, didn't happen. And so he, he would get something, but Mitch Trubisky does not want to be a Steeler next year. He, he was the captain, the veteran, gets benched. He was angry about being benched and justifiably had a, a valid complaint about it um, during that Jets game. He does not want to be here. So it comes down to the old Mike Tomlin He's a volunteers hostage. and hostage <laughs> stuff. And the team has to decide on that. I think. In, in their world, if Trubisky said, hey, I, I would love to be here, I want to be here, I think Pittsburgh probably keeps them because they're financially in a position where they probably can can afford to do that. Um, but I'm, I'm very confident Trubisky, as he just basically admitted, I don't want to be in Pittsburgh anymore. And so it comes down to the Steelers. Do they want to have kind of a guy that doesn't want to be here? Typically in Pittsburgh, they don't want they don't keep those guys. So I'm leaning towards Trubisky will be playing elsewhere next year. I am too, and I have uh, my checkered flag ready for because the day I, I think of the day he signed, I said it's, it's likely to be a one and done thing with him, uh, right. especially after after the the uh, the team uh, drafted uh, Kenny Pickett there. So uh, I'm with you. Uh, I I can go get someone else to uh, to back him up. Yeah, I mean, I eight I'm, million dollars to sit there and. I mean, is he really going to mint? I mean, I, you know, he probably he probably is a good teammate to have and all like sure. that. But oh, yeah. uh, and, 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 and a good. But I mean, he's also thinking too, man. I the the the, the clock's ticking on my career, and I'm going to have to you know root for Kenny to get hurt to get any playing time next year because they ain't they ain't going to bitch him. And I I need to go out somewhere where I might have a legitimate shot at actually getting some right. playing time once again. Even if that means a reduction in salary by a couple million, if he competes and plays and in his mind, because players always believe they're going to play well, if he does play well, then he'll get paid next year or sometime later down the road. So there'll be a long term calculation there. So that's what Trubisky, I'm sure, is thinking. We'll see what happens. Yeah, I would go find a veteran backup who that could be. I mean, you can rehash the list we talked about last year. I throw out a Mike White with the Jets, even um, Heineke in Washington, just as some names off the top. Don't hold me to those. I'm sure people will. But you can find somebody cheaper than Trubisky. Um, but again, I think Pittsburgh would like to have them. They want to have a veteran backup. They're going to have one regardless of if it's Trubisky or not. But it just comes down to, do you want to have a guy that does not want to be here? Again, in Pittsburgh, generally they say, you know, here's the door. Now, in full, in, in full uh, uh, disclosure here, we did not hear the comments. We The comments were reported by by prior at ESPN. So we're having to take them in that context, but in that context, it sure sounded like, man, if I had to do it all over, if I would have known this was going to be the end game, I would, I would have waited. Right. I'm not sure what context there is that really puts that in too much. Right. I, I just want, I just want no, to I understand. You know, sure. throw it. Cause you know, uh, we are full. We're, we are all about, you know, making sure trying to contextualize every, everything, you know, no, you're right. And he might've said, 
that got cut that was in that article that I love Pittsburgh. Who knows? He could have said a bunch of other right. Stuff. It might have um, got chopped up or who knows, you know. But the fact there's been no agent, no no clowny agent, sure. damage control type stuff kind of says that maybe they're okay with that being out there. Anyway, uh, we'll, we'll have time to talk about that later. Eight million, they could, they could use that $8 million. Yeah. Uh, last thing I want to talk about from Tomlin on Monday was just uh, his defense of George Pickens and basically asked, uh, I forget what the, the actual question was, but Tomlin explaining why did he always defend George Pickens and say it's a quality young man. He thinks he was kind of misjudged in the pre draft process, viewed as his character concerns. There's always been some lingering rumors about that. And Tomlin basically pushing back and said, those concerns don't exist. They're made up. They're all that draft rumor BS type stuff. And so he's certainly gone to bat for George Pickens. Yeah, yeah. The question specifically, obviously, we saw skill level of George uh, George Pickens. Uh, uh, where where did you see him from the majority of character development as the season went on? Mm -hmm. And uh, he says, you know, I think he progressed uh, in the ways that most of the rookies progress. I just think it's a natural thing when you're a young guy and you get put into a professional environment around grown men that you grow and grow at a rapid rate. I saw that from him. I thought the consistency of his play and his product productivity uh, kind of represented that growth, but it's a really natural thing. Uh, he goes, I some, you know, I sometimes get resistant when I get asked about his maturity and character related things, because oftentimes I believe he got mischaracterized pre-draft. And so that's why I'm combative at times and defensive when it comes to him. He's a quality young man. He is, he's a professional. He's been really consistent in his work throughout. He loves football. He likes to work. We haven't seen a lot of things that we hear rumors regarding in terms of him. And that's why we defend him. Yeah. And I think, you know, when Pickens came out, there was no major thing. I mean, the stuff they talked about was he got ejected, I think, from one game, fighting with a player from Georgia Tech. He uh, squirting squirted a water with a squirt bottle in Tennessee. I mean, stuff that, you know, isn't good, but it's not. It's pretty low on the list of real actual character flags. You know, you got so many guys coming out with legal issues and all that kind of stuff. Guys that get kicked out of school didn't happen with Pickens. So is he a little immature? Yeah, probably, but he's what 21. I mean, I think he was generally, yeah, he got upset in the Falcons game. A receiver got mad that he didn't get the football. I mean, my joke was any receiver that's content with, with not getting the football is called a tight end. Like <laughs> every, every receiver wants the football to me. It's just, that's non-story type stuff. All right. Uh, anything else from Mike? I think that was it from Tomlin. Let me just kind of scroll through. Did you, do you want to save this for maybe Wednesday show, but you had your early free agency primer, the opponent list for next year. Also, we should note that Pittsburgh officially picking seven, holding the 17th pick in the uh, 2023 NFL draft and what technically the 32nd pick with holding the top pick of the second round. Uh, real quick, uh, 2023 opponents, obviously, most of these were already known anyway because the NFL's rotating schedule. You're going to play in division, home and away against the Ravens, Bengals, and Browns. Uh, on the road, Jacksonville, Tennessee, Arizona Cardinals, San Francisco 49ers. Those were known. Uh, the, the ones that got added because of finish were the New England Patriots at home. And the, did I say home or away? I think I said home and all those. Uh, Jacksonville, Tennessee, Arizona 49ers. Patriots and Packers. We had to wait till the end of that game last night to, 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 to figure out some of this stuff here. But those are the teams that uh, the Steelers will play at home. The away games, in addition to Baltimore, Cincinnati, and Cleveland, are Houston, Indianapolis, the Rams, Seattle, and Viva Las Vegas. Uh, they will come out to Vegas uh, in 2023 here. So some West Coast uh, trips in there. They'll obviously travel a lot more in uh, a lot, lot more in 2023 than they did in 2022. Uh, 22. Uh, as you stated, they currently hold the 17th pick in the 2023 NFL draft. Oh, and uh, thank you. Thanks to the uh, Texans and the Bears. The Bears now have the uh, first overall pick, obviously, in the draft. And they also own the first overall pick in the second round. Well, they don't own that, by mm -hmm. the way, because they traded that to the Pittsburgh Steelers for Chase Claypool. What a move by Omar Khan there. That, that pick, even though it's technically 33rd overall, it will be the 32nd overall. So, it's in, you know, uh, essentially you have two first-round draft picks as a result of that trade there. Uh, as far as the free agents go, we have, have plenty of time to talk about a lot of these, but I will run down the unrestricted group real quick. Larry Ogunjobi, Mason Rudolph, Devin Bush, Cameron Sutton, Chris, Chris Wormley, Derek Watt, 
Jesse Davis, Tyson Otawalu, Marcus Allen, Terrell Edmonds, Robert Splane, Malik Reed. Ugh, what a we 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 tried to warn people about mm-hmm. that one, didn't we? Uh, yep. Wonder where that old fella is that uh, emailed us a couple of times uh, there about Malik Reed. Malik yeah. Reed was inactive again, second game in a row. He can't play AFC North ball either, by the way. Uh, Dem- I had to take we had to take a victory lap on that one real quick, <laughs> Alex. Uh, Demonte Casey, Anthony Miller, Carl Joseph, Trent Scott, Miles Boykin. Benny Snell Jr. and Zach Gentry, a list of 19 players uh, set to be uh, uh, unrestricted free agents. Obviously, a lot of those guys will just be allowed to walk. There is a handful of them, though, that you would probably think might be back. Cameron Sutton, probably one of those. We'll see what happens with Wormley. Uh, You mentioned Robert Spillane. We'll see what happens with Terrell Edmonds. I think Casey's a guy that they probably should address. We'll see what happens with Ogan Joby. And, uh, and my, uh, Zach Gentry, we talked mm-hmm. about. I mean, there's a good five or six of them on this list, Alex, that I think will be re signed or at least attempted to be re signed. You would, what would you say top two priorities are? Sutton Edmonds? Was that, was that I would say Sutton Casey, be, be honest Ooh. with you, but okay. uh, because, man, I, Casey, I. Yeah, but Casey's getting older. He's in his thirties. We're about to turn thirty. Edmund's still pretty young. Give, I mean, give me three. Give me three. All right, all right. Choose three then. All right, Sutton, uh, Edmonds, and Casey, and an honorable mention being Zach Gentry. Yeah, I don't know who two, I put. Two third. honorable mentions. Miles Boykins also. <laughs> all right, uh, just the whole list. All right, but I mean, I, I mean, uh, once once again, I I think I think you'll see five or six of these guys resigned. Oh yeah, sure. Uh, and we have plenty of time to talk about that and and. Yeah, you know, I'm sure we will, but I think number one is Cam Sutton. I think we can agree right. upon that, and, right. and that's going to be the biggest money deal. And you know, Sutton said he wants to be back. All the players said they want to come back. Newsflash: most times, players don't say we want to leave. Um, so we'll see, but we'll have plenty of time to discuss the futures. Yeah, I'll have full breakdowns of uh, of 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 you know looking ahead at, at these guys very very soon on the site, and Alex and I will will be talking about that in uh, in the upcoming shows as well too. It is kind of crazy. I know Mike Tomlin talked about this. I think I have the same feeling. I, I'm betting you did as well to transition literally this time as we're recording at 3.30 right now, 24 hours ago, we're sitting there, you know, eyes glued to scoreboards and can this team make the playoffs? And at one point thinking this team's got a real shot to do it. And now we're sitting here 24 hours later going, all right, offseason stuff, draft stuff, free agency. And it just, it turned so quickly. They would have had Buffalo and that's a, it's a tall mountain to climb. I mean, the defense was playing good, but can the offense can the offense score with Buffalo? And I, I think it would have been a quick one and done, uh, pers- per- per- personally. But you know, you know, that, that's why they play uh, in any given Saturday or Sunday in the NFL, right? And we've seen that yeah. time and time again there. But uh, it is the fun, fun finale. There was part of me once you got into that second half of that thing after seeing the way the Steelers game was going. Uh, thinking I'll be damned. They're going to, they're going to end up getting in here. You know? Yeah. I mean, it's at one point because you felt like Pittsburgh was going to win that game and then the bills were beating the Patriots. And then you had the tie between, between the dolphins and the jets. And that thing was very much back and forth. And you thought, okay, you know, if the jets got to make people at one point with like four minutes left and you thought, all right, they might do this and didn't work out that way. So Pittsburgh, uh, they obviously will not want a playoff game this year. We have not won a playoff game since 2016. And that continues to be the, uh, the mark on this team that they're trying to break. Everybody wants to know about the salary cap, Alex. Well, Dave, when's Dave going to do a salary cap? I will give you as rough of a rough. No, this is rough, but this is me mocking out the the rule of 51 here with uh, uh, year two salaries uh, just as a buffer here. Okay. Uh, because right now this team has 36, 37 players, I think under contract, uh, right now. So mocking out the rest of the rule of 51, you know, you got to have, you got to work off a rule of 51. So you got to add some placeholders in there. I did that. I, I have an estimated carryover amount, uh, right now. Uh, the cap right now is kind of estimated it, uh, and you know, none of this is firmed up, but 225 million, uh, is you know the supposed to be kind of maybe what the cap will come in at it could obviously obviously come in more uh i have this team people are not going to like this number they're going to think what dave's got something wrong here how about 1.5 million 
over the cap. Mm. Can you explain? Yeah. Uh, you got William Jackson on your roster at 12.75 million. You've got, uh, you, uh, you, Trubisky, I guess, uh, Trubisky. You got uh, Keller Witherspoon, uh, you know, 4 million base salary in there. Uh, all this stuff adds up, man. And you got T, you know, you got TJ Watt. Uh, but but Dave, you said they're going to be fine. Yeah, they they will be because they're going to make the cuts that they need to make. They're probably going to, you know, they'll they'll get to the point maybe where they restructure the deals of of TJ Watt, and Minka Fitzpatrick, uh, here. And look, I haven't even got to the point of the future salary cap cost. <laughs> The projected uh, future salary cap stuff of the rookie pool offset, the end of the rule 51, the practice squad estimation of $4 million, uh, an injury injured reserve buffer of $3 million, an in-season injury replacement fund. You know, they want that $9 million in space at the, end, at the beginning of the season there. You want to add all that up onto what I already gave you of being over the cap of uh, – uh, of uh, $1.5 million, uh, they are over the cap with all the estimated charges, $23.4 million. Is that, and you're working off a cap number of 225 Yes, sir. Is that, how likely is that to go up? How firm? I know it's not known uh, yet. It, it might go to 230 I think. Okay, but nothing right. dramatic. Um, if you but, had to guess, and I know I'm blowing a lot of minds here, probably <laughs> yours, included, including mine. Yes. You know, here, but, uh, there's a lot of massaging that they're going to be able to do. I mean, already we're talking about, you know, I, 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 you know, William Jackson's gone, right? Sure. Especially at the numbers. So if you had to adjust the, the numbers based on expected moves to clear cap, how much do you project this team to be at? If you, if you begin to massage the cap. All right. Well, you know, the projected future salary cap expenses don't happen in real time. We've gone over that. You don't have to worry about that until later, later in the year. They're going That's to happen. That's the rule of 51, right? Uh, no, I'm talking about uh, the, the, you know, I'm talking about the rookie pool offset, oh, okay. uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the end of rule 51, the practice squad, the injury reserve, the in, you know, the stuff that happens right there at the final week of uh, the off season and all like that. Let's just work on off season number of a 1.5, you know, uh, not worried about the stuff that's going to come. Let's work off that $1.5 million over uh, right okay. now. And remember, they don't have to be cap compliant until middle of March. Right. So, right, right. Uh, but uh, uh, William Jackson, there's 12.75 million. Okay. Okay. Uh, Akella Witherspoon, good chance they cut him $4 million. Okay. I've, I've already trimmed off nearly seventeen million dollars for you, right there. What's going to happen with uh, Mitch Trubisky? Let's assume that he's cut just for this exercise. All right. There's eight more million. There's twenty-five million dollars right there in cap space. I just cleared for you. All right. So now you got you got twenty-four million to work with because you were a million over to start. Right. Okay. Uh, uh, anything else? And so you got restructures too, and that could create. I guess it depends on what. Oh man, uh, probably around. You know, between I think Watt and Fitzpatrick alone, twenty-two million. Oh wow! Okay, that you, so that then you you're can, up to right forty-five right. plus million. Okay, so there you go. Now everyone feels better about you scaring right. the heck out of them five minutes ago. Right, right. I mean, but but you know, people people want these numbers, but they don't know. No, I understand. Sure. When they get them, they don't like them. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. And then they say, "Well, you said they're going to be fine. Well, they are going to be fine. They always are fine." You know, it's just, you know, uh, just some things have got to happen uh, through, 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 through regular off season stuff and uh, that off season stuff. And, and look, you're going to see stuff on the internet today. Uh, uh, over the cap has the Steelers. I forget what number is 12 million, 12 million under or something like that. I think was one of the reports out there. Uh, hold on a minute. I'll, I'll, I'll read you. This is how people get uh, confused uh it when it comes to cap space and all like that uh hold on here let me see if I, it pulls up right away here okay. this is from jake trotter okay jake trotter covers uh the browns for espn 
not including any future contracts. That's a key point here, not including any future contracts. Cap space projections for 2023 in the AFC North per over to cap. Uh, he has the he has the Steelers at 17 million in available cap space. All right. Well, he just left off a key a, 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 a key point there. One, 17 million uh, and and and, and inc- not uh, no future contracts. Well, you've got to fill out that rule of 51. You know, uh, and and that's a lot of spots there at even minimum salary. That's going to take up a lot of a lot of space there. Uh, here's something else that over and over the caps not accounting for. Proven performance escalator right raises for Alex Highsmith and Kevin Dotson. Right, right? that's a good, a decent chunk right there. That's what, three or four two, million, two million, you know, three million, three, okay. three and a half million, or something like that. Right. So, right. Uh, you look at uh, how much the filling out the rule of fifty-one is. You look at the uh, the proven performance escalators. I just ate up your seventeen million and and a million and a half in a haul. So. That's how people get confused with this thing by people throwing out numbers out here without any context of it whatsoever. Right. No, it, it's valuable to break that stuff down. That's why I trust you. Why I think basically all Seagulls Nation trust you on, on all things cap. But for those who just want to know the bottom line, you're saying even knowing the initial figure based on the teams this team is likely to make, certainly could make, that they're going to have a fair amount of cap space come the start of free agency. They're going to be able to do – and once again, you, uh, the rookie pool offset, you don't have to worry about until later in the offseason. That's $4.3 million. You don't have to worry about your 52nd and 53rd player until week one of the season. That's $5.8 million that you don't have to worry about until later. Practice squad, that's $4 million, all right? Uh, uh, an injured reserve, some, some players are going to end up on injured reserve at the start of the season and, and, and be against the cap. That's a $3 million buffer there. There's also the team's going to want $9 million in cap space to open the, the season with at least. And that like it or not is a charge. I frame it however you'd like to, uh, that alone at some point, they've got to account for, uh, five, let's see, eight, nine and a half. And twelve twenty one and a half million dollars there that's got to be accounted for at some point, and that's beyond a real time number of them being over one point five. I know I'm blowing a lot of minds here. People thinking, Dave, you're out of your freaking mind. I'm telling you that, that this is the way it works, and it's going to start with uh, William Jackson the third getting cut. It's probably going to include Levi Wallace getting cut. Uh, I I mean, uh, uh, Akella, Akella Witherspoon getting cut. I got him right here. One, you know, because they may mm-hmm. have the same cap same charge uh, here. Uh, Akella Witherspoon getting cut. Uh, good possibility. We'll see what happens with 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 Mitch. I don't see how you can carry Mitch Trubisky at eight million dollars. We had that conversation just a little while ago. There. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, I mean, and then you know potentially uh, uh, restructuring the, the contracts of T.J. Watt and Minka Fitzpatrick. And and if you needed to, you can go to Deontay Johnson and get 4.7, 4.7 million there by, uh, by a restructure. So, uh, it will all come out in the wash at some point, you know? Yeah. Which reminds me, I have laundry that's done. So thank you for that reminder on the wash comment. Um, and it is also important to, to remember that for a free agents, they do sign. You can always mess with, you know, first year base salaries right. and cap charges. And so you can sign that guy to a big deal. And that first year, you know, hits going to be pretty low. Right. Right. I mean, look, you've got, I mean, you talk about, well, how, how, you know, Dave, you told me 225 might be the cap number. How did we, how did you eat up that money so quick? Well, here's your top five cap, uh, top five cap charges as you sit here right here now uh, in this moment. Twenty nine million for T.J. Watt, twenty two point two million for Cameron Hayward. That right there, those two alone, that's uh, fifty one million. Uh, Minka, eighteen million. Deontay Johnson, sixteen point three. So what's thirty four and and fifty one uh, million? Uh, that's 85. Is that what it is? All right. 34 and, and 51. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And then now add another 13 million on the Chiqua, with Chiquamo core for you're almost at a hundred million right there. All right. So you've eaten up, uh, you know, uh, right at half your half of 200, you know, half the cap space there just on those players. And then you've still yeah. got the rest <laughs> of the rest of the roster to fill out there. 
Yeah, it adds up. Salaries have increased every single year. It's, so that's just, you know, the way this thing goes. But it's good perspective. It, oh, it's by reminder- the way, you've got $8 million in dead money already. From? Well, 4. 7, 5, from? Uh, you got $4.75 uh, $4. million from Stefan to it. Mm. Uh, Cameron Sutton, when when his contract voids, right. uh, is two point one million in dead. Uh, I mean that's 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 six point eight million of your eight million right there. Yeah, and, and why point. and why is Stefan to it uh, have dead money this year? Because that happened after July first. You know. Mm. Yeah, that, that that it all adds up, and so it, it's a reminder. I know that. I know you hate this phrase too. The salary cap is not a myth, but it is malleable. It is flexible. And this is a reminder in that, that we're, even if the numbers look scary to start, there are certainly lots of ways to clear cap space. Right. Just be careful because you're going to see that number from Jake. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, you know, from, from Jake on Twitter, from ESPN pointed out, you're going to go run off to, uh, over to cap. And you're going to see there's 17 million under, but they don't even have a rule working rule of 51 yet either. And they have not accounted for uh, uh, the, the the proven performance escalator raises either. All that stuff's got to happen, folks. You can just, you know, I, and look, I, I love over the cap. I, I think they're absolutely the great. I, I, if you're going to go get, you know, salary cap information outside of Steelers Depot, go there. But mm-hmm. they are they are missing a few things already. You know? It is curious they don't build in. I can see that them not including the performance escalators because they might not know exactly who's qualifying and all that. But I'm surprised no, they, they don't have they, it built in know. for the rule of fifty-one. I mean, uh, yeah, they have. Well, I wonder they, why they don't do it then. Well, they haven't. They haven't added it in yet because you know, I guess the player technically could get cut or what. You know, it it hasn't mm-hmm. hit. It hasn't officially hit yet for for starters. Right, but they should include the rule of fifty-one because that's known. I mean, that you can't. That that's that's a known number. It, well, I mean, as it currently uh, stands, right. All they're working off of, though, is is uh, is players under contract right now. Right. I'm I, I'm just wondering why they they don't factor that in because they know it's going to be a component of of the cap. That's what they do. They're a cap site. Right. But any anyway, that doesn't matter. Um. So that that's your cap update. Now you know you'll be talking about that more. Um. As we kind of get some more clarity as the cap number finally comes in, in I don't know a month or so or maybe longer, and go from there. Right. All right, Dave, let's get to a couple of reader emails running a bit long today. So just a couple and a uh, reminder uh, tonight, uh, Dave and I will have a live stream on YouTube at probably before 7 p.m. Eastern time. So uh, you want to ask more questions, you can uh, do so there. Just search my YouTube channel. All right. Uh, let us get to it here. Also, by the way, I assume we'll be getting some futures contracts from Pittsburgh signed in the next couple of very, days. As very well. soon. So, That'll help fill out the role of 51 there. Yeah, a lot of practice squatters, a couple probably outsiders, um, maybe Thad Moss, maybe that guy from Michigan State, but a lot of the practice squad guys. All right. Uh, look, we're going to be back on uh, Wednesday. Let's answer. Uh, we're, we're running long, aren't we? Two hours? A little bit, yes. Uh, a little right. under, but we're running pretty long. All right. Let's let's uh, let's let's get some reader uh, emails on Wednesday. Okay. Again, if you guys want to ask questions, be sure to live stream tonight. We'll call it 6.45 p.m. Eastern time, but earlier tonight. And uh, be sure to hang out with us. Just again, search YouTube channel. Just type in Alex Gazora. We'll see it. Uh, over there. All right. In the meantime, follow me on Twitter at Steeders Depot. Follow Alex on Twitter at Alex underscore Kazora. Follow the show at Terrible Podcast. Email the show, the Terrible Podcast at gmail.com. If you like what we do and want to donate to the cause, go to SteedersDepot.com. Hit the donate button. Upright navigational bar. Also, if you want an ad free version of the site, go to SteedersDepot.com. Hit the ad free button as well. Thank you, everybody, for a tremendous, a tremendous 2022 uh, season, both on the site and the podcast. Alex and I certainly do appreciate it. I'm going to try to give you one more year, Alex. You and I. I had a at least that you know conversation. We're going to do that. Uh, uh, also have some exciting news I think coming up that we're going to announce probably in the next week or two weeks uh, as well on on top of it all. So thank you, thank you, thank you everybody. And until Wednesday, as always, thanks for listening to the Terrible Podcast with Dave and Alex.